Welcome to today's webinar to release the results of the nation's report card 2013 Mathematics and Reading Grades 4 and 8. I am Cornelia Orr, Executive Director of the National Assessment Governing Board and moderator for today's event. The National Assessment Governing Board is a bipartisan organization created by Congress to set policy for the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or NAEP, which you also know as the nation's report card. The board is committed to making NAEP an understandable, useful resource. And to that end, we're very excited today to introduce an all-new nation's report card in an interactive online format. You'll hear more about that uh, later. Today's report card reveals what fourth and eighth grade students know and can do in mathematics and reading on NAEP with results for both the nation and states and jurisdictions. We can compare these data with assessment results dating to the early 1990s, allowing us to reflect on trends in student achievement and progress on gaps in achievement between various student subgroups. This new online format makes it easier than ever to sort for multiple factors, see mathematics and reading results side by side, and explore results through the big picture questions, as you will see. Um, later, Jack will be giving a demo of that, so I hope you won't um, try to wander around on the site while we're having this uh, presentation, and you'll absorb the presentation and the speaker's remarks, because he will later give you a demo that will make it much easier for you uh, to find your way around that site. Throughout today's presentation, we also encourage you to join in an ongoing Twitter chat using hashtag NAPETALK to broaden the conversation. Today we have a distinguished panel of experts who will share their thoughts and reactions to the report card. I'll briefly introduce each one of our speakers, and then our webinar producer will review the event logistics with you. Our first speaker will be Jack Buckley, Commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics. He will present the report card findings and give a demonstration of the new online report format. Our next speaker will be State Texas State Senator Leticia Vandepute, who is a member of the National Assessment Governing Board. Finally, we will hear from William Weidlich, Executive Director of the Association for Middle Level Education. Following William's remarks, we will have an online question and answer session with all of the speakers today. Before we begin, Nathan Gilbert, our webinar producer, will review logistics of the WebEx system with you. Nathan. Well, thank you, Cornelia. If you have technical difficulties during today's webinar, please refer to your confirmation email or call 866-229-3239 for assistance. Our speakers will answer during the Q&A session later in the event, but attendees are welcome to submit questions about the report card results or speakers' comments throughout today's presentation. So don't wait. At any point, simply type your question into the Q&A panel in the lower right side of your WebEx screen. When you submit your question, be sure to choose the option in the drop-down menu that says All Panelists. Please include your name and organization with all questions. Please also note that live closed captioning is also available in the bottom right corner of your screen in the Media Viewer panel. Click, click the X at the top of the Media Viewer if you'd like to close the captioning panel. And back to you, Cornelia. Thank you, Dathan. It's now, it's now my pleasure to welcome our first speaker. Thank you, Nathan. It's now my pleasure to welcome our first speaker. Jack Buckley is the Commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics. Our first speaker today is Jack Buckley. He's the Commissioner of the National Center for Education Statistics on leave from his position as a professor of applied statistics at NYU. He is well known for his research on school choice, particularly related to charter schools, and on statistical methods for public policy. Jack served as Deputy Commissioner of NCES from 2006 to 2008. He spent five years in the US Navy as a surface warfare officer and nuclear reactor engineer, and also worked in the intelligence community as an analytic methodologist. 
After Jack's remarks, he will provide a demonstration of the new report card website before we hear from the other panelists. That means there's a chance that some of our attendees may experience a lag in the webinar due to a personal bandwidth capacity. If that happens, please bear with your computer, and we encourage all of you to try the website out for you later at the conclusion of today's webinar. Jack? Good morning, everybody. I'm very happy to be here today to release the results of the 2013 Mathematics and Reading Assessments from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, or the nation's report card. So these are the first of several reports that we'll be releasing in the coming months. This report is also the first NAEP report to feature our new web format, where we provide a variety of interactive features that make NAEP data even more accessible and usable than in the past. This assessment was given earlier this year to fourth and eighth grade students around the country. And today's results are just for the nation as a whole and for the states, but we also assessed mathematics and reading in 21 large urban districts around the country. And results for those districts will be released on December 18th. In addition, we assessed mathematics and reading at grade 12 in 2013, both nationally and in a pilot program at the state level involving 13 states. Results for these assessments will also be released soon. So the assessments were administered in early 13. As you can see, we had very large samples, uh, as always in, for the reading and math uh, national and state assessments, about 37,000 or 377,000, sorry, fourth graders, and about almost 350,000 eighth graders. We've got results uh, for the nation for both public and private school students. At the state level, though, we have public school results only for all 50 states, uh, as well as DC and the Department of Defense school system, which we treat as states, of course, for comparison purposes. As always, we report student performance in two ways, scale scores and achievement levels. NAEP scale scores indicate what students know and can do. For mathematics and reading, scores for students in grades four and eight are reported on the zero to 500 point scale. These are separate scales, of course, for the two subjects. And the achievement levels, which were developed by the National Assessment Governing Board, set standards for what students should know and be able to do. For each subject and for each grade, the governing board has established standards for basic, proficient, and advanced performance. And ultimately, the goal is to have all students performing at or above the proficient level. Students who reach the proficient level display solid academic performance, or as we often say, they demonstrate competency over challenging subject matter. All right, so let's start by looking at the results for mathematics. As always, the NAEP Mathematics Assessment measures student performance in five content areas. Number of properties and operations, measurement, geometry, data analysis, statistics and probability, and algebra. NAEP average scores represent student performance across all five of these content areas. And today we'll just present average scores. So these two graphs show the average mathematics scores with grade four at the top and grade eight below. What you can see is that in both grades, mathematics scores were higher in 2013 than in any previous year going back to 1990. At grade four, the average score in 2013 was 28 points higher than in 1990 and one point higher than in 2011, two years ago, our most uh, recent prior administration. At grade eight, the increases were 22 points in the long run and one point respectively. So these score differences, like all other comparisons of NAEP data that I'll talk about today, are tested to ensure that they are statistically significant. I'm only going to discuss differences that meet the test for statistical significance. If there's, there may be other uh, differences in the various tables and figures that would appear to be uh, uh, substantively significant but may not actually meet the, the statistical test. And we'll denote things that are statistically significant on all these slides. Uh, in this case, with an asterisk by the score numbers. So here, if you, for example, the asterisk in the top for 2011 uh, grade four denotes that it is statistically different than 2013. Uh, likewise, there are many asterisks uh, as you go down the time series because uh, over time, 2013 is, is the highest uh, score that we've ever attained for fourth graders. We also, though, have a new symbol here, uh, which in this case is shown as an upward pointing triangle, which denotes that a given year is statistically significant from the immediate prior year. So if you look at 2011 for fourth grade, the triangle there is telling us that uh, the 241 is a statistical improvement over the 240 in 2009. But if you look at 2009, that circle there 
actually means that, that it's a statistical tie with the immediate prior year of 2007. Right, so as always in NAEP, uh, we also disaggregate by a variety of different factors. So here we just present a quick summary of results by race, ethnicity, uh, and also gender, as well as looking uh, briefly at some achievement gaps. So the table, the left-hand side of this table, the green uh, part shows comparisons for 2013 back to 1990 uh, for fourth graders and also for 2013 back to 2011. And then on the right-hand side, the yellow or goldish uh, section of the table shows comparisons uh, back to 1990 and back to 2011 for eighth grade. So one thing we see here is that in 2013, scores were higher than in 2011 for white, Hispanic, and female students in fourth grade math. And additionally, if we look back to 1990, all student groups in grade four, except for American Indian and Alaska Native students, made score increases. One issue we have here is that the samples for American Indian and Alaska Native students back in 1990 were actually not large enough to allow the reporting of reliable results separately for that group. Also back in 1990, we did not collect separate data for Asian students as opposed to Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. That's something we were only able to do in 2011, which is why those comparisons are not shown uh, for the long term in those two columns. So if we look to the right-hand side in grade eight mathematics, Hispanic, Asian and Pacific Islander, American Indian and Alaska Native, and female students all had higher scores in 2013 than in 2011. Uh, and just like in grade four math, all, students, uh, all student groups except for American Indian and Alaska Native students made score increases over the longer term. So below the race and ethnicity disaggregated scores, we have information on the changes in both the white black and white Hispanic score gaps, where we compare the gaps in 2013 back to 1990 and 2011. As you can see there, there's only one change, which is at grade four in the white black score gap. The good news is that the gap narrowed from 32 points in 1990 to 26 points in 2013. There were no uh, changes in those gaps though looking back between 2011 and 2013. The bottom of the table shows results for the male-female gaps, and you can see there, no significant changes in these gaps for either grade. All right, so remember I said there are two different ways we present results. We've just been talking about scale scores. Uh, this now turns to the achievement levels. So these graphs compare the percentages of students at the three NAEP mathematics achievement levels in 2013, compared back to 2011 and to 1990. And each bar shows the percentages of students below the basic level at basic, proficient, or advanced. So one thing we see here is that both grades, the percentage of students at advanced was higher in 2013 than in either comparison year. So for example, at the top for fourth grade, 8% of students were at advanced in 2013, which is statistically significantly higher than 7% in 2011 and then the 1% back in 1990. And at the bottom for grade eight, uh, we see a similar increase from one point from 8% to nine between 2011 and 13. Also looking at the other side of the graph, for both grades, the percentage of students below basic was lower in 2013 than in 1990, dropping, for example, from 50% to 17% over the long term at grade four. So let's turn to the state results. So in 2013, the 19 states that we show here in green had a percentage of students at or above proficient in mathematics that was higher than the percentage nationwide at both grades four and eight. So this is just 2013 comparing the percentage of students who are proficient in both grades, and in these states it was higher than the national average. That national average for public school students uh, was 41%, and uh, for fourth grade and for public grade eight students was 34%. We bring in four more states. These states, Nebraska, Iowa, North Carolina, and Hawaii, had percentages at or above proficient that was higher than the national percentage, but only at grade four, and they were statistically tied at grade eight. Three other states, South Dakota, Texas, Pennsylvania, the percentage was higher at grade eight only. All right, so if we flip around, in these 11 states, the percentage of students at or above proficient was lower than the national percentage at both grades. We've got one state, Alaska, where the percentage was lower than the nation, but only at grade four. 
six states, Arizona, Arkansas, Kentucky, Tennessee, Georgia, and Florida, where the percentage was lower but only at grade eight. So again, this is the percentage of students at or above proficient compared to the national public percentages. And this last slide brings all the data in, plus a handful of states for which uh, there was no difference at either grade. All right, so those are comparisons in 2013 of states to the nation. Now we're looking uh, at some comparisons over time from 2013 back to 2011 for how states are doing with respect to their prior performance, so looking at some state trends. So the chart shows that states that had increases or decreases in scale scores between 11 and 13. So states where the scores increased are shown in the higher row on top. And you can see here four states on the far right of the, of the far right cell of the uh, table, top right. The Department of Defense Schools, the District of Columbia, Hawaii, and Tennessee scores increased since 2011 at both grades in mathematics. So these are states that saw both fourth and eighth grade mathematics scale scores increase over the last two years. Uh, at grade four only, we see there's 12 more states that saw an increase over the last two years, and there are three more at grade eight only in the center top row. There are no declines uh, around the country in mathematics at grade four, and there are three declining states at grade eight, Montana, Oklahoma, and South Dakota. So let's now switch over to reading. The NAEP reading assessment treats reading as a dynamic cognitive process that involves understanding written text, developing and interpreting meaning, and using meaning as, an appropriate, as appropriate to the type of text, purpose, and situation. The assessment, as always, uses both literary and informational text. So literary text, for example, would include fiction, literary nonfiction, uh, some poetry. Informational texts include expo uh, exposition, argumentation, and persuasive texts as well as uh, drier procedural texts and documents. We measure in reading uh, three cognitive targets or mental processes that underlie reading comprehension. We ask students to locate and recall information, to integrate and interpret, and to critique and evaluate. And the results I'll uh, summarize today, again, are the uh, averages of all of that information together. We won't disaggregate results by the individual targets. So if we look uh, at the time trends, results for grade four again on top and grade eight below. And what jumps out is at grade eight, scores were higher in 2013 than in any previous year, going all the way back to 1992. For the fourth graders, scores in reading were higher in 2013 than in any previous year, except for two years ago in 2011. That 221 to 222 statistically is actually not a significant improvement. On the grade eight graph, also, if you look at the bottom uh, time trend, you see a figure we haven't used before, or a symbol, rather, we haven't used, which is the upside down triangle. That actually indicates assessments that had a score that was significantly lower than that of the immediately pre uh, preceding assessment. So for example, in 2005, the score of 262 was significantly, statistically significantly lower than the score of 263 two years before 2003. So again, we present uh, the results disaggregated by race and ethnicity and gender. So compared to 2011, the average score in reading increased at grade four for white students only. For the eighth graders, there were increases for all groups except for Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander students and American Indian and Alaskan Natives. Looking back to 1992, scores increased for all groups at both grades except again, for American Indian and Alaskan Native students because of uh, not reliable samples in the early years of the assessment. Also in mathematics, in the first, uh, uh, correction, the gap results for white, black, and white Hispanic score gaps, here in this case reading, show two instances where the gaps narrowed. For the white, black gap at grade four, comparing 2013 with 1992, and the white Hispanic gap at grade eight, also comparing 2013 with 1992. The fourth grade white black uh, gap narrowed from 32 to 26 points, while the eighth grade white Hispanic gap narrowed from 26 to 21. Just as in mathematics, there were no changes in the boy, girl, or male, female gap. 2013 grade four female students scored seven points higher than males in reading, and in grade eight, females scored 10 points higher. 
For both grades four and eight, the percentages of students at proficient and at advanced were higher in 2013 than in either 2011 or 1992. In addition, you can see the percentage below basic was lower in 2013 than 1992 at grade four and at grade eight in both comparison years. 8% of students scored at the advanced level in 2013, which is shown as an increase over the 8% that scored at advanced in 2011 for fourth grade. Uh, this unfortunate instance where we, our figure here presents rounded numbers as we do in all of our reporting, so that 8% uh, is, represents something being rounded up, or rounded down rather on top, and the 2011 8% is something being uh, rounded up, so that is a statistically significant improvement even though it looks like it would round to zero here. Turning to the states, these 15 states uh, shown here in the darkest blue have a percentage of students at or above proficient in reading that was higher than the percentage nationwide, again at grades four and eight, which uh, for national public students was 34 percent, both grades four and eight. In the next nine states, in this case, the percentage at or above proficient was higher than the national percentage, but at grade four only. We had three states, Idaho, Montana, and Kentucky, where the percentage was higher at grade eight only. Again, now looking uh, at the bottom of the distribution, 14 states where the percentage of students at or above proficient was lower than the national percentage at both grades. One state, Michigan, the percentage proficient was lower than the national public at grade four only. Arkansas, the percentage was lower at grade eight only. And again, bringing them in, you see a few other states where there were no differences between the state uh, percentage proficient at or above proficient in the nation. Again, now looking at state changes uh, over time, we see five states, the Department of Defense Schools, the District of Columbia, Iowa, Tennessee and Washington State, where scores increased since 2011 in both grades four and eight reading. Four more states uh, where there were score increases, but only at grade four, and nine states that saw a grade eight reading only increases. At the bottom of the table, in fourth grade, we see three states that saw some declines over the last two years in reading at the fourth grade, Massachusetts, Montana, and North Dakota. So that's just an overview of the results for 2013. Uh, what I'd like to do now is turn to the new uh, online mathematics and reading report card where we can try to ex show you how to explore NAEP data in a wide variety of innovative ways that go well beyond what I've just presented uh, through static slides. So these results I've just presented can be explored in much more detail with this digital report card. And as we've mentioned, the 2013 re uh, release is the first time that the web rather than a traditional printed report, is our major source for NAEP results. Making use of some of the latest technology, our new website is designed to help you explore the results that interest you the most using your desktop or tablet. So we've organized the results from the 2013 assessments to address three questions. Are the nation's students making progress in mathematics and reading? What level of knowledge and skills have the nation's students achieved? and how are the states performing. On the home page here, you can view videos designed to answer each of these questions in about two minutes by scrolling through the carousel menu. You'll also notice that we have several static menus that appear on each page of the website, such as at the top, about the assessments, where you can view information on the NAEP sample, participation rates, inclusion, and other operational aspects of NAEP. Download report, where you can download a highlights report. Download infographic, where you can download a simple infographic of just summarizing what the 2013 results say. And some new uh, sharing icons that let you share content on social media sites easier than before. You can also access complete results by using the menu at the bottom of the page. So data tables summarizing national and state sample sizes, participation rates, and information on students with disabilities and English language learners are located under the Summary Data Tables tab. You can also download additional detail for average scores and achievement levels for states and jurisdictions under the Summary Data Tables. We make these available in both Excel, 
uh, in PDF formats. If you click on the Custom Data Tables tab, this opens up a menu that allows you to customize the data you want to download. You can toggle drop-downs for subject, grade, jurisdiction, so for example, national or state data. In a selection of variables like gender, eligibility for the National School Lunch Program, school location or type of school, and which statistic you're interested in, for example, average scale scores or achievement levels. And under the Executive Summary tab, you can see high-level results for the nation and for selected states for both reading and math. These include national results and a version of the uh, disaggregations by race ethnicity and gender that I presented uh, on the slides earlier for, for the nation and also for a selection of states. All right, so if we go back to answer the first question about whether students are making progress, you already know the answer from the results I presented earlier that they are. But of course, that's only part of the answer. And the website provides additional information that shows, for example, that not all students are making gains. So for example, here you can see that while there are overall gains in grade four mathematics, when we look at the uh, percentiles, only students at the 50th, 75th, and 90th percentiles showed a statistically significant improvement from 2011. So those are denoted by the yellow arrows in the thin yellow rectangle uh, at the 50th, 75th, and 90th percentile. And the, the numbers upon which the figure are based are in a small table at the bottom. You can see here again that scores for lower performing students, so students at the 10th and 25th percentiles in the distribution did not change significantly over the last two years, although they did change significantly over the long run back to 1990, the, the green boxes and green arrows. Up at the top, drop-down menus on each page make it easy to see similar types of results uh, for each subject and grade in the assessment. And on each page of the online report, you can easily switch to view any subject and grade. So here, let's take a look at percentile changes for grade eight reading. So we can see uh, here a little bit different story than grade four mathematics, that they, the improvement that we saw over the last two years in grade eight reading, actually uh, we find across the entire ability distribution from the 10th to the 90th percentile. You can also see where various percentiles fall in terms of NAEP's achievement levels. If you click on any one of these trend lines, it highlights the results only for students scoring at that percentile, so here for the 50th. Uh, and again, back, this is in uh, grade four mathematics. If you click the little plus sign next to any of the achievement levels, it will expand uh, to tell you about what that achievement level represents and also what percentage of students reached the level in 2013 and back in the first assessment year, here for mathematics, 1990. Lastly, you can also scroll down to see various contextual results for students scoring at the various percentiles. So here are comparisons of sort of what does a typical student who's below the 25th percentile look like on some characteristics compared to what is a typical student who's above the 75th percentile. Uh, so for example, here 76% of fourth graders scoring below the 25th percentile in math were eligible for the National School Lunch Program, which we use as always as a proxy for family income, compared to 24% scoring at or above the 75th percentile being eligible for the National School Lunch Program. If you want to see how different student groups are doing, ch select Changes by Student Groups, where you can find selected results like uh, by, for example, race, ethnicity, gender, family income, as measured again by the uh, lunch eligibility, and more in this drop-down menu. And you can see here long and short-term gains for selected groups at a glance, with a full trend results once again presented in the uh, charts below. Tables, uh, next part down, tables uh, showing the proportion of students in each group and how they've changed over time are also available here. If you click on the tab. So the online report highlights score gaps between selected student groups and how these gaps have changed over time too. So here is a look at the mathematics uh, fourth grade white black achievement gap and as shown by the asterisks in the example here, the 26 point score gap between white and black fourth graders in math in 2013 did not differ significantly from the 2011 gap but was smaller than the 32 point gap in 1990. Now I mentioned that verbally in the slides earlier but here you can see 
uh, both the gap over time and also where each group scored over time, so you can look exactly where on the distribution that gap fell. You can view these statistics by pairs of racial and ethnic group, uh, by students with higher and lower family income, and gender. One of the few changes that we saw in racial ethnic score gaps uh, comparing 2013 to 2011 was in mathematics at grade eight. So here in 2013, you can see that Asian and Pacific Islander students scored 12 points higher than white students, which was wider than the nine point gap in 2011. So this, you know, we've been throwing a lot of numbers at you. Uh, one great question that people always have when looking at NAEP results is sort of what does this mean in terms of what students actually know and are able to do? So to help you find out about the level of knowledge and skills that students have achieved, the new website actually provides sample questions uh, right integrated in the report that show you what students performing at each, each achievement level are likely to be able to answer correctly. So for instance, this question on the grade four mathematics assessment asks students to determine the rule used to generate the numbers shown in the output column of this table. Fourth graders performing at the proficient level with a score of 260 or above were likely to identify the correct rule, which is option D, that each number in the output table was two times the number in the input column. If you scroll down, you could also see uh, an estimate of the percentage of fourth graders who actually got, who selected the correct response as well as what other responses that uh, groups of students chose. You can use the drop down menus again uh, to look at this, the same kinds of information for other subjects or grades and look at the questions uh, asked there. So the last question addressed on the website focuses on how states are performing. In addition to the state results that I've already highlighted for you today, the digital report card provides information on how state scores and achievement gaps have changed over time. Furthermore, users have the ability to zero in on individual state results and demographic characteristics of their choosing that maybe were not traditionally presented in the printed reports. So here's an interactive map that shows gains over time in grade four math. 16 states had higher scores in 2013 than in 2011, and no state declined over the last two years. Further down the page, you can view just how much those scores have changed from a specified year to 2013. So for instance, Tennessee and the District of Columbia both had seven point gains in their scale scores since 2011 in grade four mathematics. And the drop down menu here allows you to see a score change for any of the uh, previous assessment years administered at the state level. We've also introduced a new interactive state comparison tool. So this map allows you to select various states. So for example, California, Tennessee, the District of Columbia, and then click see results to compare. Selecting see achievement levels, see scores by percentiles, and see percentages of students by race and ethnicity, or just scrolling down the page, will show you each of those results. And as always, you can also change which subject or grade level that you're looking at by clicking the drop down menu and just making a different selection. All right, so that's just a quick overview of the results for 2013. Uh, we urge you to use the new online mathematics and reading report card to explore NAEP data in a wide variety of innovative ways. And uh, we're very, very excited about this new resource and uh, do, again, really urge you to take advantage of it. So just in closing, as always, I would like to sincerely thank all the students and schools who participated in NAEP and made these results possible, and also uh, remind you to uh, feel free to engage with us on social media, both using the icons in the new web tool and also using hashtag NAEP. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Our next speaker, State Senator Leticia Vandepute, has represented Texas's District 26, covering a large portion of San Antonio, since 1999. In January of 2013, she was elected to serve as the Texas Senate's President Pro Temp, after which she was named to Texas's monthly list of the 10 best legislators. Congratulations, Senator Vandepute. Senator Vandepute is a former president of the National Conference of State Legislatures and the National Hispanic Caucus of State Legislature. And in both of these roles, 
she brought a strong focus on education. She is a member of the National Assessment Governing Board and serves on the Governing Board's Committee on Standards Design and Methodology. Thank you for your time today, Senator. We look forward to hearing your perspective. Thank you, uh, Cornelia, and thank you to Jack for that great overview uh, of our results. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, give a few comments this morning on this important webinar. Just as the nation's report card website has undergone major changes in how it presents data from uh, the National Assessment of Educational Process from our NAEP, um, our country is undergoing major changes in regard to testing sentiments. Uh, if you're keeping up with testing in America, I know that you are aware of the broad anti testing movement that is sweeping our country today. And even here in my own home state of Texas, uh, actually the birthplace of the beginnings of No Child Left Behind, this movement is being fueled by parents who are fatigued by high stakes testing. And that's testing that really is given in the name of accountability but is most punitive to our children. And I know that while I support reducing, if not eliminating, the high-stakes testing, I, like many others, still know the importance of accountability for where we are heading as well as where we're coming from. And it is important to have a measuring stick that gives us the data that we need to guide leaders who make important decisions on educational resources and funding. And NAEP is that measuring stick. It's not high-stakes. It doesn't reveal a particular student or school scores. It's completely independent of politics and of education reform efforts. And NAEP is the only yardstick that can reveal student achievement nationally and by state and by urban district and all of the different variables that we have. And that's why NAEP, I think, is more important now than ever. What other assessments can tell you about the dynamics and gaps in achievement among students of different racial and ethnic groups in the nation, for example? Of keen interest to me are the achievement trends for our Latino students who make up a significant portion of the school population in my district and, of course, now in Texas. And this NAEP report shows that the white Hispanic score gaps really did not change significantly from 2011 to 2013. And looking long range, when we first started collecting state data, even as the scores of Hispanic students increased over time, the white Hispanic gap only narrowed at grade 8 reading in comparison with the 1992 statistics. In Texas, we see a similar story in the white Hispanic score gaps. Scores for Hispanic students were at least numerically higher in 2013 than the early 90s in Texas at both grades and in both subjects. And especially noteworthy are the grade 8 math scores from 1990 to uh, 2013, in which time the white Hispanic gap narrowed by 9 points. However, these gaps did not narrow across the 4th and the 8th grade math and in reading between 2011 and 2013. In fact, when you look at our grade 4 reading, it appears that Hispanic students lost a little ground. And while student scores stayed consistent, with the average score of 233 in those two years, Hispanic student scores went from 210 in 2011 to 206 in 2013. And although that change really wasn't uh, statistically significant. But results like these are very beneficial. They allow us to look at performance trends and investigate what's working when it comes to boosting achievement. They also can show us weak points that challenge us to think in, of ways to address academic concerns. And I'm hoping even more education and policy leaders here in Texas and my colleagues across the country understand the value of NAEP. I am reminded that with no child left behind and so many states asking for waivers, that NAEP results provide us with so much useful but not high stakes information. NAEP is the test everyone should want to be part of. Thank you so much for allowing me to make a few comments today. Thank you very much, Senator. Our final speaker today is William Widely. 
He is the executive director of the Association for Middle Level Education, which has more than 30,000 members worldwide. Prior to serving in this role, William has been a teacher, State Department of Education official, adjunct university faculty member, association executive, and curriculum development director. He was one of 20 U.S. teachers selected to the Krista McAuliffe Institute for Educational Pioneering. William has also served as a local education association president, a local school board member, and legislative liaison to the state legislature. William, we look forward to your insights on the results today. Thank you, Cornelia. It is my honor and pleasure to make a statement for those important and significant results in middle-level education. As the Executive Director of the Association for Middle-Level Education, I have talked to hundreds of middle-level educators and leaders who have shared their experiences. These stories have included many successful practices and policies that are the keys to educating adolescents. The results from the National Assessment of Educational Progress 2013 assessments in mathematics and reading at grades 8 and 4 and 8 complement those successful practices and policies that those educators and leaders have implemented over the years. It is now November, and teachers and students have been back in school for a few months. Educators will have delivered a successful back-to-school night, have been engaged in effective team meetings, and have forged strong relationships with their students. Teachers and administrators have settled down from the high of the first days of the new school year, and they are covering the curriculum by moving through each day's planned activities. But are, they, are their students learning? A fellow educator and colleague of mine, Lowell Hedges, taught me how to create a challenging curriculum and how to translate a curriculum guide into a lesson plan that resulted in student learning. He helped me develop techniques that covered, converted a curriculum document that seemed static and sterile to problem-solving lesson plans that engaged my students and contributed to their success. As I developed lessons, Dr. Hedges helped me to recognize that covering the content and learning the content are not synonymous. For teaching to be effective, learning must take place. Having students grapple with and master advanced concepts and skills requires teachers to stretch themselves, moving well beyond covering material. Today's results suggest that educators are doing more than covering the curriculum. The results show that math scores are higher in 2013 than in all previous assessment years at grades eight, 4 and 8, and that reading scores were higher in 2013 in comparison to all previous assessments at grade 8 and all but the 2011 assessment in grade 4. In addition, the number of students performing at or above the proficient level continues to increase. I encourage you to study the information on the nation's report card website. The results suggest that quality schools build the knowledge and skills young people need to succeed in the global knowledge-based world. There is improvement in nearly every age group. White, Black, Hispanic, and Asian Pacific Islander students, as well as male and female students, all scored higher in mathematics and reading in 2003 compared with scores from the early 1990s at grades 4 and 8. Changes in mathematics and reading scores at five selected percentiles, 10th, 25th, 50th, 75th, and 90th, showed the progress being made by lower, middle, and higher performing students. And, white and black, the white-black and white-Hispanic score gaps in mathematics and reading did not change significantly from 2011 to 2013, but there was some narrowing of racial-ethnic score gaps compared to with the mid-1990s. Given the developmental diversity present in every classroom, gearing the curriculum to each student's level of understanding is a complex task. In addition to varied learning styles and different rates of development, Students' cultural backgrounds and prior experiences must be taken into account, along with the impact of inclusion. These results suggest that more educators are adapting their curriculum to challenge students and are providing continuous progress for each and every student. This requires significant planning, flexibility, and collaboration among all teachers, counselors, school social workers, parents, and the students themselves. I have recommendations for some of the most critical stakeholders who influence our children and therefore the results of these assessments. To educators, how are you gearing your curriculum to each student's level of understanding? I challenge you like Dr. Hedges challenged me. Be the best teacher you can be by making changes into your curriculum so that it challenges and provides continuous progress for all students. To parents, in grades four and eight, parental involvement is as important as ever. 
Do your children share the results of their major learning activities with you? Do you ask questions of your child's teacher to help understand the relationship between school and program options? Your involvement is critical to your child's success. To community members, schools cannot educate children alone. The involvement of family and other adults in the community is linked with higher levels of student achievement. You can be a major educational resource by providing varied learning experiences and resources for ongoing classroom studies. To students, congratulations on showing improvement on the NAEP mathematics and reading assessments. Your extra effort will certainly result in more and better opportunities for you now and in the future. Keep up the good work. All stakeholders must recognize that middle level education serves a distinct developmental period, one in which youth mature and undergo major changes in every aspect of their being. Because of the values, attitudes, interests, and habits of mind that adolescents formulate have lifelong implications, providing an, adequate, providing an appropriate educational program for this age group is an especially challenging yet critically important task. Education drives America's ability to lead in creativity and innovation, skills needed in a rapidly changing world. Improving education requires a practical set of iterative steps towards an ultimate goal. These results suggest that America's educators and teachers are taking the right steps by strengthening our schools to ensure that our children's future and our country's prosperity. Thank you. And thank you, William. We will now respond to attendee questions during an online question and answer session. Our facilitators for this segment, Amy Buckley and Valerie Mirapodi, will direct the questions to the appropriate speakers. Ladies, to you. Thank you, Cornelia. Those of you who have questions about today's report card results or our speakers' comments, please submit them now. As Nathan mentioned at the beginning, we ask that when you submit your question, you choose the option in the drop-down menu that says All Panelists. Also, please remember to include your name and organization when typing in your question. I will note we have already received an impressive number of questions from our webinar attendees and received dozens in advance of today's event. We will be grouping together questions on similar topics and hope to pose as many as possible during the time allotted today. Questions that are not answered directly or indirectly on today's webinar will be answered later via email. A reminder that you could be hearing from Jack Buckley with the National Center for Education Statistics. Cornelia Orr with the National Assessment Governing Board, Texas State Senator Leticia Van De Pute, and Will Weidlich with the Middle Level Learn Education. Our first question comes from Gwen Kelly from Indiana University. Gwen asks, which states show the biggest reductions in achievement gap by gender and race? What can you say about why and how this is happening? Jack, can you address that question? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, it's a great question, Gwen. So of the 16 states that made uh, gains in grade four mathematics between 2011 and 2013, uh, none actually had narrowed gaps between white, black, and white Hispanic students. Of the seven states that made the gains in grade eight mathematics between 11 and 13, one state, Hawaii, had narrowed gaps uh, between white and Hispanic students. If we look at grade four reading, there were nine states that made gains between 2011 and 2013. Two of them, Colorado and Indiana, narrowed gaps between white and Hispanic students. In a grade 8 reading of the 14 states uh, that made gains over the last two years, only Utah narrowed gaps and only between white and Hispanic students. Great. Thank you so much. Our second question comes from CCSSI Math. And the question is, why isn't grade 12 tested every time? High school is where the biggest math ability fall off, falling off occurs, and high school seniors represent the culmination of K-12 education. Cornelia, could you address why 12th grade is not tested? We test um, 12th grade as frequently as we have funds available to do that. When um, our statute was written, our authorizing statute for NAEP, it authorized us to test 4, 8, and 12 as frequently as it had been done prior to uh, the, the No Child Left Behind Act, and that was every four years. Uh, it is hard to, um, 
if a system implements new high school change, it's hard to detect that in one or two year increments. And so the governing board has always been uh, comfortable that four year increments track a, a cohort of seniors from their scores in eighth grade to their scores in 12th grade. Thank you so much. Our next question comes from Nina Esposito Visita with the Pittsburgh Federation of Teachers. Nina asks, if you control for our high poverty levels in the U.S., how do our students compare to students in countries known for their education excellence? Jack, could you address that? Uh, sure, I'd, I'd happy to, to try. So one thing I should point out, though, of course, is we can't answer that question with the data we're talking about today with NAEP, because, of course, this is just the U.S. Uh, national assessment. This is not one of our international uh, comparative assessments. Uh, however, we do administer uh, both the TIMS, the Trends in International Math and Science Study, at grades uh, 4 and 8, the PEARLS, which is a fourth grade reading assessment, and, of course, PISA, which assesses 15-year-olds in uh, mathematics, uh, reading, and science. The, uh, I guess there's a couple ways you can try and look at that. So, so one sort of simple answer is that when you do adjust uh, in some fashion for uh, socioeconomic status in the United States, and all these uh, different studies measure this different ways, um, you see, as you would expect, that our, our scores, uh, you know, if you take, for example, if you only look at the higher uh, socioeconomic status groups that are their scores just as they are, a NAEP uh, are higher, and they tend to be more uh, competitive internationally. Uh, I think actually another way, though, to look at this question is to, to look at our lower performing, our lower socioeconomic status groups, which, again, just as in NAEP, when we look at, at something like TIMS or PISA, we see that those scores uh, are lower on average. But then look at some other countries that also have uh, relatively large percentages of low socioeconomic students and, and sort of look and see how those students are doing. And, and sort of two counterexamples to the U.S. that really uh, do pop up year after year are, is Shanghai, which actually does have a relatively large percentage of, of uh, low socioeconomic status students, but those students are, are actually quite high performing uh, relative to the U.S. Uh, group in a similar category on PISA. And Canada actually as well also has, uh, you know, looking at lower uh, socioeconomic status or lower income Canadians, they tend to perform much closer to the average Canadian than a, uh, the U.S. group. Uh, so there, it's, a, it's a great question. There's unfortunately not enough time. There's a lot of different ways that we could probably uh, try to answer that, uh, and, and definitely a, a very interesting topic. Thank you, Jack. Our next question comes from Rachel Tome with the Maine Department of Education. Rachel asks, how does NAEP data inform the work of individual states or schools in improving current educational programming? Will, could you start us with that question, please? Sure, thank you. Um, I believe that NAEP is just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, most often, results from state assessments are used to help schools develop a strategic plan or goals for the next year. And then that is used as a way to identify the need that might be persuasive uh, pervasive in a particular state or a school. So given the information that the NAEP would have, the school or the state might ad adopt a statewide or a school-wide intervention program to help all students grow in some uh, specifically identified area. Second, if the need is isolated to a certain uh, uh, segment of students, the state or school might adopt a focused program that would uh, allow additional personnel in the classroom or adjust the master schedule so that students could have more time uh, especially those that need the, the extra time. Additionally, many schools have other types of assessments, and, and I wanted to point out that you know, other summative assessments and other formative assessments are used in school to help uh, identify student uh, improvement. And finally, uh, good, effective middle-level teachers and leaders uh, collect lots of different types of data in addition to the NATE data, in including other qualitative data to help improve their educational programming. So conversations, student and parent satisfaction surveys, student and teacher body language, and other types of data are used and can often help uh, with the, the overall uh, improvement of improving the, school, the educational program in schools and states. So the NAEP assessment is a good piece of data, but it's just one piece of data that states and schools should use to improve their schools. Thank you, Will. Our next question comes from Lauren Leslie with Marquette University and also similarly from James Turner. With respect to uh, ethnic or racial group achievement gaps, wondering 
the data can identify where the problem is, and that is good, but is there any insight into what works and does not work? Uh, and would like to get a, a local perspective on this. Senator, could you address uh, the perspective from Texas? Absolutely, and thank you. It is such a wonderful question, given our changing uh, demographics in, in the country. Uh, you know, the beauty of the data from NAEP is that it is disaggregated. And, of course, we know gender. Uh, we know the students who uh, are free and reduced lunch. But particularly that racial and ethnic data should give us a clear line of, of where we need to be headed. And unfortunately for us, we've, we've seen some increases, and then it, it's, it seems like we are flat uh, and in, in many areas, and particularly with the gap, with a growing number of, of minority students, we really need to focus on where are the bright spots across the country that have that change in demographics but that are able to still uh, reach for the top of the leader bar, so to say, to still improve. And that's where uh, particularly helpful to state legislators, to policymakers, to folks who look at these trends within your state. Uh, if you don't know your demographics uh, and out for the future, then you can't really plan uh, for the programs. We know in the state of Texas that there are school districts that are absolutely getting phenomenal results with students who typically across the country uh, don't fare as well in, in exams like the NAEP. But that's where you can focus on what practices are they doing, what sort of strategies are they using so that the students who are coming from those free and reduced lunch households, who are students of color and, and they're excelling, that's where we need to know. We need to find out what they're doing and the resiliency and then share those best practices. But the data has to be clear and, and the data that's coming from NAEP is absolutely superb that states can use as one tool to decipher their strategies. Thank you so much, Senator. Our next question comes from Shaki Howe with the Michigan Department of Education, who asks, are there any changes related to sampling, scaling, and reporting? Clearly, we saw a difference in the online report, uh, Jack, that you demonstrated. Are there, is there anything you can speak to changes in sampling, scaling, and reporting? Uh, so absolutely, uh, really 2013 in terms of operations, so sampling, uh, our scoring, scaling, uh, uh, analytic methodologies was all essentially identical to 2011. The, the big difference, as you pointed out, is in the, uh, the public reporting, is trying to move more of the content uh, to a more dynamic reporting format. I should point out, too, that although we didn't talk about it uh, during the, the webinar portion or the presentation portion of the webinar, the, uh, all the other tools that we used to talk about at the end of a NAEP release, so the NAEP Data Explorer, the Questions Tool, all those, they're all still there too. So actually all we did was add more. We didn't take away any of those other features. And in terms of operations, essentially our procedures are the same. Great. Thank you. Our next question is from Tabitha McKinley with the New Jersey Department of Education. Tabitha states, with more assessments moving towards an electronic format, what do you see as the future of NAEP? Do you foresee a fully electronic format as a possibility in the future? Cornelia, could you start us with that one, please? Uh, sure. I'll start from the policy perspective. And the governing board has been very supportive of doing this and, in fact, several years ago established a new framework that for an assessment that would be administered only on computer. That's the Technology and Engineering Literacy Assessment. The board also um, moved the writing assessment to a totally online format and uh, is hopeful of moving reading and math there as well. And uh, that will depend on our ability to put it operationally in the field. And so I'd refer to uh, Jack if he has anything he wants to add on that. Uh, sure. Uh, that's, it's a great question, and, and Cornelia summarized it uh, very well. I mean, essentially, we see the future coming, and we are taking steps in order to, to be there uh, on time or early. We, we already moved the 2011 uh, writing assignment, uh, writing assignment, writing assessment, 
to, to a computer-based format. Uh, and as Cornelia mentioned, we're going to be out in the field in 2014 with the new uh, computer-only technology and engineering literacy assessment. And we're laying the groundwork now to make the transition uh, in, in the next couple cycles to, to uh, moving the more traditional assessments like math and reading uh, to the computer as well. Great. Thank you. Our next question is from Devin Steven with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Devin asks, how are changes in early learning policy and practice impacting fourth and eighth grade scores? Uh, clearly, this gets to practice in the field and with educators. And I'm hoping perhaps that, Will, you could address that first, and then maybe Senator Van De Pute, if you'd like to add, how you see uh, changes in policy and practice at the local level impacting scores. Sure, I can start. Um, a lot of the changes in, in practices and policies that are happening at the local level uh, have a lot of teacher and local parent involvement. And I think that's a critical step here is how do, how do we get uh, all the stakeholders involved in the process so that those uh, involved, like the teachers and others, are a part of that policy and practice making uh, development at the local level. Uh, additionally, there's uh, uh, all the other stakeholders that are involved that should be a part of that discussion also, whether it's the community leaders, the youth service providers, uh, departments of, 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 of uh, education and others that work with those local schools. So the changes, I would say, uh, are most important is how do we involve the educators and the other, uh, those impacted uh, in that change process. Thank you. That's a, a great question. What I find with our local school leaders is it's not just the staff and the educators or the parents that it really is the entire community. And so with test results, uh, the community can focus on the things in the community that will help the students be successful. So many of the things we know that happen in schools are actually the social supports, uh, the type of environments that are needed, particularly with students uh, who are from free and reduced uh, lunch uh, program and, and schools are, are typically our Title I schools. And those local supports uh, in sometimes non-educational uh, strategies really fortify the capacity of that neighborhood school, of that community. And that's where the local decision makers can really look at the test scores and then form the strategies that help that entire community. What we find, it's not just educators and parents who are looking at our NAEP scores, our test scores. It's our business leaders and it's local leaders uh, at the community level. Thank you, Senator. Our next question is from Michael Wright with Shenango Valley Urban League. Michael would like to know if there's been any improvement in the scores of African American males and have the gaps increased or decreased with respect to white students? This was part of the data presentation. However, Jack, is there anything in addition um, that can be commented on now regarding the white African American male gaps? Uh, yes, absolutely. So of course, we only had time really in the overview to look at the, the gaps on average, but, but it's a great question about disaggregating uh, by males and females. Uh, so the, bl the black male uh, student performance has increased in the long run. So when we look in re both reading and mathematics back to the early 90s, uh, you know, black male students performance has gone up, but the achievement gap between black and white male students has only narrowed uh, for grade four reading, and that's only in the long term, too. So looking back to 1992, uh, across all four grades and subjects, that's the only place nationally where we see uh, narrowing. You know, I, I won't go through every single result, and we're happy to, to follow up with you later, but there are some interesting state uh, changes. So if we look at, at back to grade four mathematics, and again, looking at the black male versus white male gap. Uh, in the long term in math, although we don't see it nationally, we do see the, the gap narrowing in some states for fourth graders. Uh, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey are all places where in math uh, we've seen that gap close. Thank you. Our next question is from Lou Howell with Iowa AFCD. Lou would like to know the $10,000 question for uh, the Senator and Will. What steps do you recommend to districts to increase their scores at the local level? What contextual factors are you looking at to improve scores? 
Uh, I can start. Um, I would say, first of all, the district needs to develop a district-wide mission or a vision for student success. In other words, what's it mean to be successful in, in our local district? Uh, second, then they're going to have to gather the data and uh, like uh, the data they would get from their Dep State Department of Education or other folks to uh, find out how their district is doing, disaggregate it, analyze it, and what does the data say about their particular district. Uh, next, they would need to develop what are the measurable targets that they need to do to, to uh, uh, achieve well, with that data. And then uh, there are several other specific steps that they might want to do as identifying specific actions and things like that. But I would say that the overall, though, is to remember that why we're doing it. Uh, we're doing this for the kids, not just for the adults' convenience. So we need to involve the families and the communities, like the senator said earlier. We need to involve the voices of the teachers and the staff. And then this process needs to be iterative. In other words, uh, once we've uh, achieved some of our objectives, we need to go back and revisit the targets and see if we need to uh, set new targets or different targets uh, in the coming years. Thanks. I think it's important to remember that our families are very complex, and the people's time and energy, although everyone says the most important thing is education, is that there are so many variables that are happening uh, in our communities that people feel we don't have control of. But what we do know is that when a community focuses on its students, on its children, then long-term economic security uh, is much more easily attainable. And so the most important thing for me is can they use the tools? Absolutely. But you've got to have the confidence of the parents and the local leaders that the results that we are presenting them are authentic, that they're verifiable, and that they're useful. I mean, if we test to test, then nothing is accomplished. But if you can take those results and use them for improvement, then that's the real win. And uh, what we like to say back in Texas is when communities get together with a common goal for our students, you got to have those champions. And in a way, the NAEP provides us with the tool uh, that we can look at uh, as one way of measuring what success and where we need to be headed. It's kind of like adding more want to the want to. You know you want to do well for the kids, but unless you have that confidence from the parents, then that's when we need to make sure that they know how good this exam is and what is really at stake here. So it is really a question of is there that community leadership because we know that the results are there. It's how they utilize them. Great. Thank you so much, Will and Senator. Our next question comes from Jay Johnson with Prosperity 2020 who asks, do the students that are tested represent a population similar to the demographics of each state or the nation as a whole? Jack, could you answer that? Uh, yes, and yes, both. So the students that we sample represent both the demographics of, of the states. Uh, in the case of the reading and mathematics assessment, where we're presenting these state level results, but also by aggregation, uh, the nation as a whole. The major difference, as I uh, pointed out during the presentation, is that when we lead off with the national results, those include and they're representative of both uh, public and private school students across the nation. When we talk about the state's results, those are representative only of the public school students in the states. Thank you very much. Our next question is really several questions that were posed to us uh, from a wide variety of people, from Intel to the Massachusetts Business Alliance for Education to National PTA and uh, Portland State University, a range of folks interested in what the implications are for these results for Common Core and their planned assessments, and vice versa, questions regarding alignment between the two, expectations perhaps of increased rigor on scores, et cetera. Uh, Cornelia, can you start us on that? And then, Jack, if you could add after, that would be great. All right, thanks, Amy. Um, these are very good questions and ones that we get a lot. And uh, so I want to first begin by talking about the NAEP math and reading framework, both of these documents and the form, the blueprint really, if you will, for the assessment that students 
this hook on which we're reporting today. They're very broadly representative nationally. In other words, they don't match Illinois standards or they don't necessarily match Alabama standards. They were selected to be broadly representative. On top of that, the Common Core um, designers relied on the NAEP framework as, a, as an input to preparing their documents. And you can see that most clearly in the language arts, um, Common Core state standards. And you can see a pretty good alignment there with that document. It's, a, it's been a little bit premature for any formal alignment kind of study because the crux of the matter goes items to items. So when there are Common Core assessments, a deeper look will be taken at that particular thing. But I would just always remind you that we definitely want to measure the curriculum in all of the states. And since all of them won't be administering the Common Core states assessment, I think we will have to, as a governing board, reflect back on whether or not any revisions are needed to the framework. Uh, Jack, I'll turn it to you. Uh, thanks, Cornelia. I, again, you know, it's, it's a great question. It's one we get all the time. Uh, this is a period, in terms of assessing student progress in academic subjects, this is a period of great change and transition in the country. And we're not sure, of course, sitting here at NCS and, and the NAEP program exactly how that's going to sort out, although we're, we spend a lot of time uh, monitoring and, 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 and working with, uh, with everybody around this. But one of the things uh, that I always like to say when we look at a, a period of change like that is, you know, it, it's very, very helpful to have at least some piece of the system that's not changing. And so one of the short to medium term roles that we envision for NAEP here is to be that, that piece of the system, to be uh, a rock to some extent that we're able to see uh, you know, longer term trends as states may uh, come and go from both trying to implement the Common Core state standards, but also from implementing some of the various uh, assessment solutions that are likely to be uh, rolling out in the next few years, that we will have this, uh, this nation's report card to fall back on and to continue to make uh, valid comparisons regardless of what's happening out in the field. Thank you. Jack, we're going to stay with you for this next question, who comes from Candice Cortiella with the Advocacy Institute. And she would like you to address the change in exclusion rates of students with disabilities for this assessment. Uh, OK, thanks, Candice. Uh, so the percentage of, of students with disabilities that were excluded uh, from the mathematics and the reading assessments uh, expressed as a percentage of the total sample has actually been on a, a trajectory of consistent decrease over time. So the highs probably in the early 2000s were about 5%. And the rates in 2013 uh, actually are all-time lows, where uh, the exclusion percent in reading is, is 2%, and it's about 1% in math. And this is as a result of both uh, the, the governing board uh, prioritizing inclusion and also uh, folks over here and our uh, contractor broader family working to meet that challenge operationally by uh, making sure that we could provide as, as much, uh, as many accommodations and other inclusion strategies as possible. Thank you very much. Our next question, will this one will be for you. It comes from Maria Salinas. She asks, what advice would you give middle school principals to help teachers become excellent teachers to students in this age group? Some work is needed in this area, particularly differentiation between classroom management and discipline. Uh, yes, that's a good question. and. Uh, uh, one uh, very dear to us at the Association for Middle Level Education. Well, the, the age of young adolescents or those that we work with in ages 10 to 15 have uh, the uh, uh, unique ability or the unique uh, uh, attribute of being at the time when their social, behavioral, and ethical, and their physical growth are all changing. So it's critical at this age group that the leaders and principals and, and teachers uh, in the middle grades have been instructed and, and have the practices in place that uh, use the differentiation that's needed for students that are in various levels of their own uh, social, behavioral, and, and physical growth that they might have at that time. So the critical factor for a principal is to work with uh, others that have that information, like our association, and have them be able to use uh, professional development opportunities so that the teachers can get the training that they need to be able to manage classrooms uh, with young adolescents. 
along the same line as the question um, the question you're asked was is that you know there's a difference between um, uh, discipline and classroom management, and that critical difference is very valuable in the uh, younger for young adolescents because many times their uh, their uh, reaction uh, may not be a disciplinary reaction; it may be a growth or a social or behavioral uh, reaction. And the teachers need to understand that difference and work with the students when the behavior is such that there's it's a part of natural growth, or is it a result is it a result of, of uh, uh, not doing the best judgment of their own. Thank you, Will. Our next question comes from Roxanne Miller with the Davis Foundations. She would like to know where she can find an outline of the assessment criteria that was used in determining the rating system. Jack, can you address that? Uh, I'm a little unclear, actually, on the question. So the, the which rating system we're talking about? The, uh, so I believe maybe, the... The achievement level? Oh, well, I, uh, Cornelia, if you'd like to start that one, uh, I can follow okay, up. I will. I will, Jack. Thank you. So the achievement levels are established by the uh, governing board, and they are essentially a policy definition of what groups of educators and others have felt uh, are indicators of different levels of student achievement or what they should be. Um, each of the achievement levels that have been set has a technical report that's on our website where you can actually follow in detail the process that was a, uh, used to establish them. But essentially, the board is able to uh, set them as a broad indicator of what students should know and be able to do at various levels of achievement. And within the, each of the framework documents, you will find a particular uh, policy definition that's used that defines basic, proficient, and advanced. So we established three levels. But in the results today, you saw that we do report a fourth level, all of those students who are not yet reaching the basic level. And um, we have found them to be quite useful. And we were talking about the international results um, yesterday. And they, I mean, uh, earlier today, sorry, we I did see that the high level in the TIMS data is very equivalent or very parallel to the proficient level in mathematics. So we'd have to go into that in a little bit more detail on another venue, but uh, we felt like that sustained us. We actually, the caller may have been asking Amy about the scoring criteria for different items, and we know that uh, there's some of that information in the NAEP questions tool. Jack, you may want to mention that. Yeah, that's what I, I was wondering. I mean, so you know, one of the things we showed in the presentation uh, when we demonstrated the new uh, electronic reporting format was the ability to see these uh, you know, various sample items. Uh, you know, the, the, the way that we know that those items fall within the different achievement levels is actually sort of the, it goes back to how the entire assessment works with respect to item response theory scoring. So it's essentially, at the same time as we assess uh, or estimate the proficiency of groups of students. We also estimate the difficulty of items. That's a little more complicated than that, but that's generally how it works. Uh, and we have, in addition to the uh, questions and their, their estimated difficulty levels that we present in the various item maps on the tool, we also have the questions tool, as Cornelia mentioned, where we have a great deal more uh, NAEP items. And we also have the ability for you to construct a test uh, to give to yourself or, or to your kids uh, pulled out of released items uh, at various difficulties, and you can set what difficulty uh, you'd like, uh, your approximate level you'd like that little test flip to be. Thank you, both Cornelia and Jack. Our next question comes from Novella Jean Walker with the United Way of Greater Atlanta, who asks, what interventions are recommended to improve student achievement, especially for youth service providers? Senator Vandervue, you. Could you discuss what's happening perhaps in San, San Antonio with regards to youth service providers working together to improve achievement? Well, what we do know is that once you get the results and the community decides that we can do better, that it is the community. And those service providers may not always have been um, invited onto campuses. Uh, we know efforts like communities and schools here in Texas and, and across uh, the country really help by helping the parents 
by helping the capacity of our parents than to help their students. We also know that there are, are programs that are specific for those uh, communities. For example, in San Antonio, uh, in states uh, like ours that doesn't have a universal pre-K policy, our voters, uh, with the help of many service providers, voted on a sales tax increase to fully fund full-day pre-kindergarten in our community, knowing that our students uh, do better academically at the third, the fourth, uh, and eighth grade level if they have a strong quality pre-K program. Now, how did we get there? We knew what the data said. And it empowers communities to look at how they can do this. But it's those community partners that really help. Some of them are uh, issues and, and uh, groups that delve on certain aspects, pre-K, literacy, Others really focus on things like nutrition and hunger because it's not just one variable, one aspect that's going to help student improvement. So it is the community that really helps us uh, have our students be in the most, uh, I guess, successful environments so that then they can really achieve. Great. Thank you so much, Senator. And that concludes our Q&A session. Thank you very much, Amy, for sending those questions our way. Um, I hope today's event will inspire you who are listening to the webinar to access this new electronic website and learn even more about the most recent NAEP results and the implications for education of our nation's students. You can visit it at www.nationsreportcard.gov and get the online report there so you can take a deeper dive into this data. On the Governing Board's event website, where you uh, got the notice about today's event, you will find links to the report cards, to the press release, the speaker statements, as well as the framework that guided the development of this assessment. In a few days, you'll also be able to find an archived version of today's webinar if you have uh, members of your staff who would like to see it and were unable to do so today. Be sure to stay up to date on information and events by following the Governing Board and NAEP on social media. You can join in an ongoing Twitter chat later today using hashtag NAEP, to con NAEP talk to continue the conversation about the results of the 2013 Mathematics Reading Report Card, and more results will be forthcoming. We will be releasing the results of the Reading and Math 2013 for the urban districts. There were 21 urban districts tested, and those results will come uh, later this year at a date to be announced, and you should follow and look for that. I want to end today's presentation by thanking Jack, Senator Van De Pute, and William for being with us today. And of course, thanks to all of you uh, for participating. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes today's webinar. You may now disconnect.